Welcome, everyone. I would like to acknowledge that this webinar is located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ginyankahaka Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and the waters on which some of us are gathering today. Jojage, or Montreal, is historically known as the gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. Colonialism confounds chronology, and as such, we respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous people and other peoples within the Montreal community. Although this webinar is taking place on the unceded land of the Ginyankahaka Nation, many of you are not, are not watching from Jojage, Montreal, so I want to invite you to reflect with us for a moment upon the lands and the histories where you find yourself now. Thank you. Thank you, Tristana. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, our CREGES conference presented in collaboration with Engage, Center for Research on Aging, and the Fondation Luc Maurice. This conference, fostering inclusion and empowerment of aging adults and with intellectual and developmental disabilities in a community univer university art hive context. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to let my colleague, Tristana, um, present Engage uh, and to present uh, the, 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 the center. Thank you. Thanks so much. And, and thanks for inviting Engage um, to uh, co-host this uh, webinar. So a few words about Engage. Engage is Concordia Center for Research on Aging. It is an interdisciplinary research center that's located on Concordia's down, uh, downtown campus. The center is composed of 38 faculty members whose collaborative expertise spans all of our academic faculties, engineering, arts and science, business, and fine arts. We do research that is interdisciplinary, participatory, collaborative and empowering, which means that we work to meaningfully integrate and strengthen the perspectives, lived experiences, and diverse trajectories of older adults into our research mandate and in our activities and events. The center's empowered approach to aging is unique. Empowered aging focuses on the collective, political, and communal conditions, environments, and infrastructures of aging, in addition to the biological ones, and looks to find ways in which to better forge these conditions in relevant ways that empower older adults to live their best lives. So empowered aging is not just a way to approach aging re research on aging, but it is a way to find more just and more ethical responses to the experiences and conditions of later life. The center runs various events and activities throughout the academic uh, uh, semester and even sort of into this early spring. So um, if you'd like to stay in touch with us, I encourage you to follow us on X or subscribe to our newsletter. And I'll drop both links in the chat. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tristana. Um, today's conference will present a study which will ex which explored the perspective and social needs of aging adults with intellectual and developmental disabil disabilities as expressed by them through art they shared in a university community art archive. This discussion will integrate insights revealed due to the disruption of this project because of the pandemic, reflect on challenges and potential solutions, and explore opportunities for policy development and social change. Uh, before I introduce the speakers, um, I just wanted to give you a quick remind reminder. For the question period, it will be bilingual and it will take place after the uh, conference. And if you have any questions during or after the conference, just you just have to write it write them down in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, uh, specifying your occupation so that our speakers can contextualize their answers. Uh, si vous avez des questions pendant la conférence et après la conférence, vous pouvez les inscrire en français dans la section uh, Q&R en bas de votre écran, et puis on posera vos questions uh, aux, aux panélistes. Now, let me introduce our speakers. Dr. Laurel Young is an associate professor at the Department of Creative Art Therapies at Concordia University. She's a CREGES member and, and the Engage Associate Director. 
Dr. Young's research focus on developing best practice models for therapeutic and practical applications of music therapy within various healthcare, psychosocial, and community contexts. She is interested in understanding how music therapy and music therapy can help individuals and communities reach their full potential for aging well. Dr. Sh Shannon Hubblethwaite is a professor at the HSC Department at Concordia and a CRIJAS member, and a member also of ENGAGE, and her research center centers around the complexities and nuances of experience of leisure for marginalized people, including older people, first-time mothers, and persons with li living with disabilities. More specifically, her research explores the social and political systems and institutions that shape, facilitate, and hinder inclusion and social engagement, specifically in the context of family relationships, digital technology, social policy, and interage or international inter international intergenerational relations. And our third speaker, Dr. Bing Yi Pan, is a music therapist and LTA lecturer in the Department of Creative Art Therapies in, at Concordia University. He works with seniors, adults, and children with special needs, adults with anxiety and depression, and university students. These are our speakers. The floor is yours. Enjoy your conference. Thanks to both Corinne and to Tristana. Um, thanks to Kurjess and to Engage, um, but especially Corinne and Tristana for all of the hard work that goes into organizing these events behind the scenes. So thank you so much. And um, a huge thank you and welcome to our audience today for sharing your valuable time with us today. I'm going to start things off today just with a brief introduction to the topic and to the project. And then Laurel and Bing, who really were the leaders of this project, will take it from there. Great. So just a little bit of context. Um, IDD is an umbrella term um, that, that stands for Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, as you see here on the screen which really is an umbrella term used to describe issues that are usually present at birth, unique, that uniquely affect the trajectory of an individual's physical, intellectual, and or emotional development. So this often includes things like Down syndrome, autism, and others that fall under this umbrella. The term IDD doesn't refer to people who may develop a disability or health condition as they age. So this is important as to why we've chosen to use the term aging adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Also related to that is the historical context where these folks really had a considerably lower life expectancy than average um, worldwide, but we'll, we'll talk here today about Canadian statistics. So many of these individuals historically had been housed in large scale, what we refer to as total institutions. And these were often situated in secluded rural areas, quite literally out of sight um, from the general public. So in the late 1970s with policy changes and the disability advocacy movement towards deinstitutionalization, this resulted in the closure of many, not all, but many of these institutions. However, as we often see as the case with um, community care supports, these kinds of community care supports didn't increase at a necessary pace. And much of the care of these folks was left to their families um, and particularly often their aging parents. However, over time, um, thanks to some of these policy changes, as well as advances in health care, life expectancy of these adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities is increasing. And most recently, Stats Canada reports that this average age is about 70 years of age compared to 80 for the general Canadian population. So for this emerging group of folks, um, what brought us to, 
to be really interested in this topic and recognize it as an important and under um, under researched area is this intersection of both ageism and ableism these stigmatizing social constructions of both aging and disabled identities that can and often do lead to social exclusion resulting in negative impacts on their health well-being and quality of life furthermore due to lack of funding and a number of myths that exist regarding the needs and capabilities of both um, of persons with intellectual disabilities um, I point you to, and I even had it on my bookshelf today, I point you to the Krijess, uh Getting Wise About Getting Old uh, book where Dr. Daniel Dixon talks about the unfounded belief that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are thought to be incapable of appropriate or meaningful social functioning. And this um, is pervasive even more so as they age. So, so in addition to that, there is, has been a lack of services for adults aging with intellectual disabilities in general, particularly with those who are younger, often being given priority for available services. And we see this um, phenomenon of aging adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, quote unquote, aging out of a lot of these programs and services when they get to be um, labeled as an older adult. So um, as Dr. Dixon has pointed out in his examination of these services um, and policies related to folks with IDD, social inclusion of people with IDD is impeded significantly by structural and social barriers born from this legacy of systemic discrimination and policies of explicit exclusion. Now, as a signatory of the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Canada has committed that developmental services for people with IDD will support them to overcome barriers to social inclusion. Um, however, we still have quite a long way to go um, because for older adults with IDD who face intersecting barriers related to ageism and ableism, these services are extremely important. All this to say that there's a dire need for more social programs and better inclusion in existing programs where aging adults with IDD can experience a sense of community, uh, a sense of belonging and agency where they can experience empowerment and fulfill their social needs and desires. So a uh, little bit of the context of how this study came to be. Our approach uh, as a team and for this project is guided by the philosophy of empowered aging that's been developed by Engage that Tristana very eloquently explained earlier, so I don't need to go into a lot more detail about that. But for us, it was really important that we consider older folks as um, and, and the process of, of aging as an active and evolving process where diverse communities should have access to resources and supports that enable the ongoing realization of potentials as needs and situations change over time. This project was also realized within the art hive model which was originally developed by Dr. Janice Timbatos, who's a Concordia art therapy professor. There are two permanent art hives at Concordia, one at the downtown Sir George Williams campus and one at the Loyola campus. Um, but these art hives are now located across Canada and beyond internationally as well. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with art hives, these are inclusive and accessible therapeutic art studios where community members come together for art space social gatherings for no fee. They're free, drop in, um, very open, inclusive environments. Everyone at the art hives are respected and welcomed as an artist 
whatever that means for them. Being present in and of itself is considered an important form of participation. So an art hive is a really welcoming place to talk, to gather, to make art and create, to learn from each other and to build, build community among, among the folks who participate. Thirdly, the, the project was also integrated into an age-friendly university philosophy. So for those of you who may be familiar with um, the World Health Organization age-friendly cities process, this is a bit of an extension of that, um, uh, focusing on creating more age-friendly universities. And this is where aging adults from all walks of life can be integrated into the university community being welcomed and supported, providing everyone with mutual opportunities for learning and well being through their involvement in education, research, as well as arts and cultural activities. The project, we're very grateful to acknowledge the support of the project from the Fondation Luc Maurice, who has provided support for various research projects at Engage. They support, the foundation supports organizations and causes that contribute to the well-being and fulfillment of aging adults from Quebec by promoting freedom to act and to think. And that certainly aligns with um, the emphasis of our presentation today. As well, we're extremely grateful for, for, for CREGES. Um, the Center for Research and Expertise in Social Gerontology, who supported this project today that we're talking about with a leading practice award in the area, the leading practice area that's called Inclusive Aging, Diversity, Health, and Wellbeing. So huge thanks to both of, of those groups for, for their support of the project. So I will turn it over to Laurel, who will give a bit of overview of the, the project. Great, thanks Shannon. So, um, just a bit of an overview of the study components. Uh, so the purpose of this study was to better understand social needs and perspectives of aging adults with IDD as expressed by them through words, music, visual art, and other forms of creative expression within a university community art hive context. Uh, and the age range um, that we're defining as uh, aging adults was uh, over 50, but we did have participants uh, 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 up to the age of a little bit over 80. Uh, this study used a qualitative research design that incorporated epistemological components, so different types of knowledge, uh, using various methodologies including participatory action research. Uh, and here, knowledge is believed to be embodied and embedded in social contexts. So the participants uh, are considered as co-researchers or collaborators who are provided with the opportunity as oppressed individuals to create knowledge that serves their own interest. Um, there was an, eth an ethnography component uh, because members of the research team participated in the art hive setting as a means of understanding the participants and their perspectives in context. Also components of arts based research uh, and here art forms are viewed as a means of expressing and or understanding one's experience. So the artistic process or outcome serves to inform the research process in some way. And finally, philosophical inquiry and what we are doing uh, with this uh, research um, and paper uh, is using argument uh, as a mode of inquiry. So, for example, uh, given the knowledge that we have gathered from scholarly research and literature to date and synthesizing this with knowledge gathered through engaging directly with the research participants in this context, how can aging adults with IDD realize their own unique social and quality of life potentials and experience feelings of inclusion and empowerment and why is this important? So just a brief uh, uh, overview of the data collection procedures. Uh, so as I noted, we gathered re relevant knowledge from the literature. Uh, we conducted individual interviews with the archive research participants, um, and you'll see later on uh, some of their care partners. 
Uh, we collected observational notes uh, and reflections via interacting with the participants in the archive context, and there were photographs and recordings of creative expressions. The analysis procedures involve using qualitative content analysis techniques to organize and synthesize the data into categories as a means of constructing a cogent argument as to why it is important for aging adults with IDD to be provided with opportunities to fulfill their social needs and desires as expressed by them. Uh, we then are making connections with how the art hive approach and the empowered aging philosophy uh, utilized in this study aligns with this argument using uh, examples from the data and, and, and incorporating those uh, directly into uh, the paper. Uh, and we also have to, in this methodology, account for unexpected findings that may enhance, shift, or even complicate the argument. Uh, and now I'm going to pass it over to Bing, who's going to uh, talk a little bit more um, about the archive uh, uh, context itself. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, before we share some of what we learned, we'd like to provide some more context for this project. The archive used for this research project was located on Concordia's downtown campus on the fifth floor of the 17th floor EV building located on the St. Catherine Street West in Montreal. Uh, you can see in the first picture on the top. The lower left hand corner is a picture of the front entrance of the sidewalk where participants were dropped off and picked up by Transport Adapté, the, re, the Montreal Public Transportation System for Persons with Disabilities. Usually, this area is much more crowded and busy than what this picture shows. This is where we waited for each participant to arrive and to be picked up, involving several different vehicles. And the picture on the Lower right is the inside entrance, and it is also usually much more crowded and busy, which various events. For most of the research participants, the business of the university was quite exciting as they engaged with people and experienced events. Even if it was only on their way to and from the archive, or while waiting for transport to take them home. The entrance location also posed some challenges, which we will briefly discuss later. As the archive was not easy to find in the EV building, one of our participants decided to make the direction sign that you can see in this slide. The other two pictures are of the archive space itself. These are not our research participants, but a stock photo, as we don't have the permission to share pictures of the participants. The photos show a bright open concept public space. There are faculty offices above overlooking the space and people were passing by while our sessions were taking place. This archive has since been moved to a newly renovated closed concept space in the university that's in the first floor of the ER building on the Guy Street, where the Creative Arts Therapies Department is now located. Uh, Laura is going to talk a bit more about this new space when we get to the knowledge mobilization part of this presentation. Uh, this slide is the research project timeline up to March 2020. In 2018, we formed the multidisciplinary research team. In 2018 to 19, we secured project funding. In winter 2019, research ethics board approval. Uh, we recruit pro, um, recruitment procedure initiated. We hired art archive facilitators which is a combination of professionals and students from disciplines of art therapy, music therapy, and therapeutic recreation. An eight-week pilot phase took place over May and June 2019. 
there were only three participants, which highlighted a need for a meant study to ensure a broader scope of aging persons with IDD could be included. Although the care partners and organizations had made inquiries, the affiliated aging adults with IDD who wanted to be involved did not have the legal authority to provide their own informed consent to partic participate in the research. Therefore, we submitted an ethics amendment to Concordia Research Ethics Committee in fall 2020. This allowed individuals to participate with the consent of their legal substitute decision maker, along with a commitment that each individual would still participate in a supported decision-making process by their own. Once the amendment was approved, recruitment procedures were initiated and we hired our high facilitators. Um, we easily achieved the maximum sample size of eight participants, which is the number we felt could, we could be safely accommodate in the open concept space. And we had a small waiting list. Data collection started on January 22nd, 2020, with the plan that 18 three hours weekly archive sessions would be offered. Unfortunately, only seven sessions were held before the university closed due to the pandemic. I'll pass to Laurel, talk about what happened next. Actually, it's Shannon. <laughs> oh, sorry, Shannon. It's okay. I'll just jump in for one more quick slide and then Laurel's going to uh, run with it from here. Um, so, hmm, what happened in March 2020, right? The pandemic hit and nobody had any idea how long this was going to last. And so we waited and we waited and we were hoping for things to reopen again. And by the time we got to 2021, we realized that this group component of the, the Art Hive project wasn't going to be able to resume because of the public health restrictions and, and the nature of the folks who were participating in the research. So the Art Hive facilitators were paid out to the end of their, their contract and they helped to organize some of the data that had been collected up until that point. But then we started to wonder, well, can we work with just this data that we have or what else might we do that could align with the original aim of our study? And so as with many folks at the time, I think it became a really interesting opportunity for us to understand and explore uh, how the pandemic had impacted the, the lives of these folks. And so in that, um, we expanded a little bit the purpose of the study to add that we would um, try to understand how that interruption of the project, given that they had started and they'd had a very enthusiastic seven week participation in the program, um, to understand how that impacted their lives and how stopping that during COVID impacted their lives. And so in this process, we engaged in online and phone interviews with folks. Um, and it, that included the perspectives of the participants themselves. Um, and so, but additionally also to professional caregivers, to family caregivers, four of the participants themselves. So unfortunately, four of the other original participants didn't have the support that was needed in order to be able to participate with us in a phone or an online interview about the project. So we'll talk a little bit more about the challenges of that um, online engagement. So um, with that new focus in mind, um, we, in the winter of 2022, um, we had done those interviews in the fall, the research assistants had transcribed the interviews, and we then initiated the data analysis um, component of the project. Okay, thanks Shannon and Bing. 
Um, so there's not enough time uh, to share all of the results or implications, but we will share some key takeaways. Um, so Art Hive or University contextual affordances that fostered inclusion and empowerment of the participants. So participants felt included as part of the university environment and felt pleased and excited to be there. One participant said, I like coming to Concordia because it's a school. A family care partner said everyone in our family has gone to Montreal universities. So now she felt like Concordia was her place too. Taking a taxi to Concordia unaccompanied by a care partner was also cited by two participants as one of their favorite things about coming to the art hive. They felt like independent adults. The art hive context fostered feelings of inclusion, agency, belonging, and social connection, which empowered participants to express themselves and interact in creative and authentic uh, ways. And for me, this is one of the most important uh, takeaways from the study. Because this is not about uh, prescribing activities to make people quote unquote feel better. Uh, it is about creating an, a cre uh, an inclusive social environment where aging adults with IDD feel safe and empowered to discover and be who they truly are. When that type of environment is established and maintained, the creative mediums can then serve as powerful and accessible modes of authentic self-expression and help to build social connections and relationships. Uh, and here's what some of the participants uh, said about that. I like to come here because you guys are so nice, because it's nice big space and we can do what we want. You know, art, I love it. I love doing that. Another participant said, it's important to show up. I'm great at being helpful. Another participant said, I feel very happy when I arrive. It's good to see everybody. When asked in an interview, what were some of your favorite things about today? The participant responded, I like to play music. Why did you enjoy the music? Participant responded, because we're together. I like being together. In addition to expressing positivity, participants also felt comfortable to express complicated feelings uh, related to various losses, death of loved ones or other friends with IDD, loss of friends due to relocation. Sometimes they had to relocate or their friends had to relocate because the conditions of their care situation had changed. Um, they lost longtime support companions who moved on to other jobs. One family care partner indicated she has lost more friends than I have. Some spoke about missing the programs that they no longer attended because they had aged out of those programs. Some experienced mandatory retirement due to age from work programs that were specifically set up for adults with IDD. Discussions on these issues were initiated by the participants themselves. One individual brought in photographs of his retirement party. Uh, and this was also indicated to us in the interviews by their various care partners. Point three on the slide, professional creative arts therapies and therapeutic recreation staff and students, along with access to a wide range of creative mediums and materials, helped to ensure that participants had constructive opportunities for self-expression and social interaction that considered their unique needs, preferences, and strengths. The Art High facilitators need knowledge and skills to be able to support and respond to participants in the here and now as their needs and preferences emerge. They need to understand the intricacies of how creative and leisure mediums and materials may be utilized to support these needs and preferences, knowing how to create the conditions that support constructive creative engagement. They need to understand how to hold the art hive space and keep it safe without making it feel restrictive. On the other hand, some of the Art Hive University contextual challenges. Due to safety concerns inherent in this context, participants did not always feel independent. Uh, one individual indicated, I feel bad when people are waiting for me to arrive. I would like to go up to the Art Hive on my own. After the first week, two participants who came independently uh, via public transportation were able to come up to the art hive on their own. However, we also needed to make sure that participants who came by transport adapté arrived safely. The drop-offs were not always safe. Um, there were instances where they were dropping them off in the middle of the street and we were in the middle of traffic and we were helping them in. The entrance uh, of the building is sometimes very busy. There's potential for being bumped into or, or tripping. 
Uh, and we also needed to make sure that individuals were at the right place for their scheduled pickup because transport adaptate won't wait. Um, so those were some of the um, um, some of the safety concerns. Another safety concern was food. So we had individuals with dietary restrictions. We had one participant with quite severe food allergies, uh, diabetes, caffeine sensitivity, uh, overeating, etc. But we still wanted to provide a sense of agency over what refreshments they wanted to have, um, as food was a very important part of their social time. So we were always trying to strike a balance there. Uh, point two, the open art hive concept uh, within this university context limited musical self expression and the ways in which music experiences could be realized. We had noise complaints. Uh, there were faculty offices nearby. Uh, environmental services came by with a noise meter. Uh, we were in the process just prior to the pandemic of negotiating a, a set music time uh, so that the impacted faculty could plan around that time. But this was limiting as the point was to provide a space where participants could express themselves musically throughout the duration of the group whenever they wanted to. However, on the other hand, we couldn't always control the extraneous noise in the open concept environment, which impacted participants needs for quiet time or low key relaxation music listening experiences. Uh, in the interviews that happened after uh, or, or during the pandemic, one participant indicated that she had sometimes found the environment to be too noisy. And then the third point uh, with regard to contextual challenges, logistical issues uh, such as transportation services, which sometimes were early uh, and sometimes are late. Um, art hive location, uh, it took time for us to get to and from the art hive. Uh, bathroom breaks, getting winter clothing off by the time everybody got their boots and coats off, uh, it almost seemed like it was time to put them back on again. So the time that we could spend in the social and creative ac um, uh, activities and expressions was sometimes limited by these things. One individual said, I feel bad when we have to get ready to leave. I want to stay longer. Okay, so unfortunately, we, we don't have permission, um, didn't have permission to photograph or video record the research participants. So it is difficult to fully portray their vibrant essence, their strong desire to express themselves, their preferences, feelings, and opinions, their desire to engage in meaningful relationships, to feel seen, heard, accepted, and included. However, we hope these examples of participants' creative expressions will help you to experience a palpable sense of them. In the upper left-hand corner, there is a gold medal for patients in a decorated box made in collaboration with a participant uh, who had a scheduling mix-up with Transport Adaptate who were over two hours late in picking her up. I could not get hold of her care partners. As she waited patiently and was starting to tire, Bing and I told her she deserved a gold medal for patience. This brought a huge smile to her face, uh, and we found out that she was very proud about her past involvement in the Special Olympics, an important part of her identity. The next week, the Art Hive facilitators worked with her to make this medal and decorate a display box, which she proudly showed to others and took home. The photo in the right upper right hand corner shows 18 collages that this prolific artist participant made in a single session. She sustained this type of productivity most weeks, simply needing to be provided with creative materials and the art hive facilitators took their lead from her. This participant spoke very little and had been labeled um, by some of her support workers as difficult or challenging. While she certainly displayed what I might call as uh, describe as determination, her way of being in the art hive was not overly difficult or challenging. Uh, possibly because while keeping safety issues in mind, uh, we gave her as much choice and independence as possible. And in turn, she demonstrated a desire to not only participate in creative activities, but also demonstrated a desire to support others and contribute to the group. There was a situation uh, where another participant was upset and chastising himself because he had spilled his coffee. While we were reassuring the participant that this was no big deal, this individual got up from her chair, located some paper towel, went over to the table where the coffee had been spilled and cleaned it up. She then came back to sit in the group music circle and beside the participant who had spilled the coffee. She felt empowered to help rather than leaving it up to the art hive facilitators. 
And finally, on the bottom slide, there is a brief lyrical excerpt from a goodbye song written by one of the group members. He was inspired to write this song after we sang Leaving on a Jet Plane in our first session. He worked on these lyrics between sessions, emailing me suggestions, and we would work each week to refine the lyrics. We recorded it the week before the lockdown, not knowing it would be our last session. And I'm just going to play a brief excerpt of this song for you now. Um, and if you're not hearing it well, please, I've got the volume on Mac, so please turn up uh, the volume uh, as you can uh, on your own computers or devices. So here we go. All the jobs are done, we're almost ready to go. As we're looking at the clock outside the door, and we Okay, so we don't have time to talk about each one of these creative expressions, but I wanted to share a few of them with you, again, so you can get a palpable sense of these individuals uh, and the kinds of uh, activities and, and uh, things that they expressed uh, in the archive environment. We have collage, we have writing, we have coloring, drawing, painting, uh, and uh, also using a, using a, a wood-burning device to, to make those uh, uh, playing X's and O's. So some pandemic related or additional insights that emerged uh, as a result of the, um, uh, the amendment that we did to our study. Uh, so in terms of care partners, both personal and professional care partners typically do not feel that they have enough support and this got worse during the pandemic. Uh, one of them indicated uh, about their family member, she does need a lot of stimula stimulation and since the pandemic, I'm the only one who will provide enter the entertainment or facilitate, you know, all the things. Without me, there's nothing. Uh, a professional uh, care partner indicated, I had many clients who had extreme anxiety. I needed to reach out to many psychiatrists who gave me just a bunch of consultations. One family caregiver indicated a need for programs at large to be longer in duration. Otherwise, for them, they said, it's not an afternoon of freedom for me, it's an extra day of work. It takes a lot to get the participant ready for their program uh, before they are already back home and the care partner has not had any time for themselves. Uh, the care partners discovered things that they did not know uh, about the Art Hive participants through these interviews. For example, one family uh, care partner did not know um, that her loved one sang. Both uh, professional and family care partners were skeptical that online programs could be a feasible or useful alternative to in-person programming. In home settings, uh, the family care partners felt that they would need to be present to navigate the technology and though not completely adverse to that, again, that's, that's impinging upon their time, uh, which is already um, used up. Uh, also not feasible uh, in group homes from a human resources or funding perspective, uh, according to some of the professional care partners that we interviewed. Also, uh, they indicated that it's hard to establish rapport online, especially for older adults with IDD who have had limited exposure to technology and who rely on sensory and nonverbal cues. So what we can take from this is that technology is not the panacea or panacea or all encompassing solution in the way that it's often made out to be. Not everyone can just go online. So pandemic related insights uh, with the original research participants, the aging adults uh, with IDD. So the pandemic restrictions evoked complex responses. Uh, 
Uh, one of the professional care partners said that a particular participant, she said, started to act out at home. She did not understand what was going on. This was dangerous for her elderly parents and for herself as well. One of the archive research participants uh, said, I couldn't even see my sister at Christmas time. Uh, another family care partner said, she was very confused and sad. There were limited resources to address these complex responses. Some of their support workers were redeployed. Uh, a professional care partner indicated, we learned a lot about regression through the pandemic. Moving forward, we now need to prevent the type of regression we saw. The archive uh, research participants had limited opportunities to engage in creative activities during the pandemic. Some did do crafts uh, or music listening, uh, but some did no uh, creative activities, especially those who had more independent types of living situations. During this confusing and uncertain time, the conditions were not present wherein they felt empowered to express themselves through creative means. Creative expression to me is like self-actualization. So people are better able to realize their creative potentials when their basic needs for safety and belonging are being met. And uh, the last point on this slide, which I actually was a little bit surprised about, um, despite only having had seven research sessions uh, and the passage of time. So these interviews were being conducted with the participants a year and a half after our last session. They maintained, the four of them that we were able to interview, a strong desire to return to the archive. One of the participants said, I miss singing and I miss seeing Bing and you and all the gang. And I miss the snacks. I told you snacks were important. Um, one of the uh, family uh, care partners said she still asks when can she uh, when can she come back to that art group where she was knitting a blanket for her pet dog. And another uh, care uh, partner said family care partner she really seemed to take Concordia as her place a place for her and she really missed it a lot. So how will knowledge gleaned from this research project and process be mobilized in the real world. Well, including today, we've done four conference presentations uh, and this project was featured as part of an online uh, Concordia media story. Uh, we need to connect with community organizations, those that provide services for aging adults with IDD, uh, but also those that don't consider them. Uh, as Shannon mentioned, Montreal has an age friendly city designation, but is this really the case when certain segments of the aging population, such as this one, are not taken into account, and especially when it comes to accommodating their needs for social inclusion in their city and in their communities in ways that actually work for them. This is not just about taking care of these individuals. Society can learn a lot from them, but only if they're not hidden away. We have an academic manuscript in preparation, but it's also important for us to publish in forms that are accessible to a broader audience, something perhaps like an op-ed or a blog publication or commercial publications. We'll see where that leads. The outcomes of this project also include uh, flexible guiding principles for inclusive and accessible programming that will support uh, social inclusion of aging adults with IDD and consider their needs as expressed explicitly or implicitly by them. Perhaps these could be hosted on the Engage website. We'll see where they go. Uh, and I'm going to come back to the quote uh, that um, Shannon referred to uh, by Dr. Daniel Dixon, a political science scholar, and his work focuses on um, public policies that aim to act against the marginalization and social exclusion of aging adults with IDD. And the quote is, the biggest obstacle to pursuing successful person-centered outcomes for older adults with IDD may be resource scarcity in the social services system. However, person-centered care is not too expensive to implement, but rather the logic of exclusion is deeply embedded in political institutions, social services structures, and broader attitudes. Disrupting this logic is a monumental task, particularly in relation to other social service priorities. So in regard to point four on the slide, the university and art hive can serve as forms for knowledge mobilization that can help to disrupt the logic of exclusion. 
So the remaining funds that we've had for this project uh, have been applied to a time limited knowledge mobilization project in the new archive space. Uh, a combination, some of the original research participants have returned, um, but we have new participants, but this is not a research project anymore. It's knowledge mobilization where we are applying the results to practice and refining our guiding principles. Um, if this group is going to continue, we're going to need funding uh, because the ironic thing is that it's easy to, easier to get research funding than it is to actually get funding for services that are supported by the research uh, that we have done. Um, also would like to note that we had 12 professional or students 12 professionals and students involved in this project from beginning to the present time, creative arts therapies and therapeutic recreation. And this has a ripple effect as they mobilize what they learned uh, through uh, moving forward in their own professional work uh, as a result of this project. Uh, and the presence of aging adults with IDD in the university disrupts in small but meaningful ways this logic of exclusion. They are interacting with people as they enter and leave the building on the elevators, in the washrooms, in the hallway. They are noticed and the members of our university community uh, are, are they're all in, in engaging with each other. Uh, constructively. And this is a small, but I believe very important way of changing attitudes. Uh, and I hope that today we were able to disrupt for you at least some of the logic of exclusion. And I just want to quickly uh, show you, this is the new art hive space um, that the knowledge mobilization uh, component is taking place in. Uh, at the bottom, we have some considerations that we all collaborated on to make this um, uh, uh, a constructive space for all of us. Uh, again, just to give you a sense of the creativity that is happening in this space. And finally, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of the research participants and the new Art Hive attendees, along with the professional staff uh, and Concordia research assistants that have been involved throughout the duration of this project. I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators today, uh, my, the co-investigators for this project, and uh, stay tuned. There is more to come, and we are now ready to take your questions.